Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. Today, we have a session sponsored by the American Historical Association, and we'll be focusing on a new book by Catherine Kramer Burnell entitled 24-7 Politics, Cable Television and the Fragmenting of America from Watergate to Fox News, published in August by Princeton University Press. Joining us this afternoon as commentators are Margaret O'Mara of the University of Washington and Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt. I'm Eric Garnison from the George Washington University. I co-chair the Washington History Seminar with Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And for those of you who don't know, the seminar is a collaborative and nonpartisan venture of the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association. And we've been working together to explore new historical scholarship since 2010. A couple of very quick things before we get going. First, let me invite you to next week's session on November 27th at 4 p.m. Eastern Time for a session by a new book by Marvin Seuss of Trinity College Dublin entitled The Nationalist Dilemma, A Global History of Economic Nationalism, 1776 to the Present. Second, like to recognize two people whose hard work behind the scenes make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the American Historical Association. Third, on the logistics front, today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And finally, when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function or the Q&A function on Zoom. You will have to unmute yourself at your end if you wish to pose the question directly uh, when we call on you, and we'll call on as many folks as we can. Okay, with those preliminaries out of the way, we can get the seminar fully going. Our author this afternoon is Catherine Kramer Brunell, an associate professor of history at Purdue University. Her research and teaching examine the historical intersections of media and politics with a particular emphasis on the American presidency. Her first book, Showbiz Politics, Hollywood in American Political Life, explores the institutionalization of entertainment styles and structures in American politics and the rise of the celebrity presidency. She's senior editor of Made by History at the Washington Post, and her writing has appeared in The Post, Reuters, The Atlantic, NBC News, Time, Financial Times, The Nation, and Newsweek. Today, she will be talking about her latest book, 24-7 Politics, Cable Television, and the Fragmenting of America from Watergate to Fox News, published last August by Princeton University Press. Catherine, welcome to the Washington History Seminar. Glad to have you here. Thank you so much for having me and for all the work behind the scenes uh, with the Wilson Center and the AHA to making this event happen. Uh, thank you, uh, especially to my esteemed panelists, um, Nikki and Margaret, whose work has shaped so much of my work uh, and my thinking about the historical intersections of media and politics. And thank you to everyone for coming, uh, to listening to work that I have been thinking about and studying and analyzing over the last eight years. It's really exciting to be able to share it uh, to the broader world. Um, in, the, in the book, I tell the story about the political battle over cable television, both how to structure it and how to use it. The book charts the, the democratic promise that cable television offered during the age of network broadcast television, which is dominated by the big three oligopolies, and then how it eventually emerged as a privatized medium designed to disrupt and divide Americans as it tethered politics to profits. The book is about regulatory and legislative debates, as well as innov innovative and experimental approaches to using the medium. And indeed, it shows how deeply connected these two stories are. It tells the story of some really interesting and colorful cable legends, uh, like the, the unpredictable Ted Turner, who launched CNN in 1980, or the very calculating executive of the, the cable giant TCI, whom Al Gore called Darth Vader, John Malone. It tells the narrative of the even-handed and modest Midwesterner, Brian Lamb, whose vision for C-SPAN brought television cameras into the chambers of Congress. 
Others are behind the scenes innovators whose reputations have made them celebrated cable pioneers, figures like Bill Daniels or Tom Wheeler, the head of the cable uh, National Cable Television Association in the 1970s and 1980s, who then went on to become the chairperson of the FCC under Barack Obama in 2013. Other men, and they are almost exclusively white men who are dominating these conversations that are happening in a corporate um, rooms and policy um, conversations as well. Uh, there are people like Tom Whitehead who transform policy discussions about television in the White House, Congress, and then the FCC, and then use that government exper experience and their regulatory insights to make it big in the private telecommunications industry. These cable pioneers caught the attention of television hungry elected officials and citizens alike with a promise that cable could launch a new type of democracy grounded in market choice. People across the political spectrum bought into that promise because they saw how cable could advance their own political agendas. President Richard Nixon saw an industry that could take down his broadcasting enemies, where Al Gore envisioned a style of television that could hold the powerful accountable and help boost his White House aspirations. Newt Gingrich reimagined congressional procedures, uh, like special orders on the floor of Congress at the end of the day to make himself a star with a small but very loyal national following. And Bill Clinton and Ross Perot understood how the cable dial could help them connect to a public that craved entertainment more than politics. So today, I wanted to start the conversation by sharing a few sources that capture this historical trajectory and the historical process. And I think that they also provide insight into the archival research uh, that is at the core of the book. One of the key arguments of the book is excavating the role of Richard Nixon in shaping the trajectory of cable television. During the 1960s, cable had emerged as a very highly regulated industry designed by federal policy so that it would expand the reach of broadcasting rather than compete with it and offer an alternative to it. Again, this was by regulatory design, uh, crafted by the FCC and supported by elected officials, many of whom had an economic and political stake in the broadcasting system. Um, and they were very friendly uh, with uh, local broadcasters and um, uh, network executives um, at the big three, um, ABC, CBS, and NBC. This was not Richard Nixon, though. He was not one of those people. Um, and in his election in 1968, it was very transformative for the broader television industry in a variety of ways. Nixon believed two things about television. First, that it mattered, perhaps more than anything else, um, it, to political success. And second, that it was biased and out to get him. So he saw the deregulation of cable as first a way that he could better, he, he could embrace the medium because he could better control his message that was really appealing to him. But perhaps more significantly, he saw it as a tool in his war against the, the networks that he thought were, again, biased and out to get him. He saw cable and promoting cable as an alternative to, um, to uh, broadcasting uh, would break down the social, political, and economic power of the networks. And here's the first source that I wanted to share. Um, uh, here is one of the really fascinating sources I found in Clay the Clay Whitehead papers, who is the director of his Office of Telecommunications Policy. And in this OTP um, office pursued this project that they called Project BUN. And BUN stood for Break Up Networks. And you can see here that he's talking about this notion that politically, economically, or phil philosophically, the problem to the network news problem, uh, or the, the solution to the network news problem is in communications policy. And he identifies cable as the place to address it. So this network news problem that he talked about in a variety of capacities, and his staffers came up with a variety of different solutions for them, um, is, is what he saw as biased coverage. Um, um, and the political control that the networks wielded. 
And so this is one of many uh, efforts uh, that is at the core of how he's thinking about cable and how he's identifying the deregulation of cable as the solution to what he sees as biased media. Nixon's administration ultimately shows how shaping the news was not just about shaping messaging and press coverage, it was also about policy that could alter the business terrain. And I think it's a reminder um, when we think about political history and politics today about um, that self-interest uh, frequently determined some of these legislative decisions, uh, particularly when it came down to how to structure media institutions that elected officials saw as central to their political power. And this is something that the cable industry leaders understood. They recognized um, uh, and they tried to use this insight into their advantage to then change the regulatory environment in ways that benefited their pocketbooks. And this brings us to the second source that I wanted to share today. Um, and this is a letter from Bill Daniels, um, again, a, a broker and investor um, in the 1950s and 1960s, makes a lot of money in cable. Um, and he's frequently called by his colleagues uh, very affectionately in the industry, the father of modern cable because of his biz business savvy. But he was also very savvy politically. Uh, while serving on the National Cable Television Association board, which is the main lobbying organization for the industry, he urged his cable colleagues to offer free time on cable stations to local, state, and national officials as a public relations strategy. He wanted to use news coverage as leverage to then give legislators a stake in cable's growth. Um, and so here's one of the documents where he talks about, this is after Richard Nixon's election, he talks about this idea of congressional of a congressional television series in which representatives and senators would be able to control the narrative about the day's events, frequently like they did on local news programs. But then they would cater this directly more to their desire for control over this coverage and the, the end result of that news program. And he's very explicit about the purpose of such a program, that it would be a significant and meaningful breakthrough in legislative relations, that this could uh, benefit the industry because um, it was good politics and therefore it was good business. Such a plan never came to fruition, but during the 1972 election, the NCTA made it a priority to expand what it called its political cable casting, which is a lobbying campaign working directly uh, to bring candidates to the cable dial and extol all of the benefits for them. As candidates themselves were searching for ways to play media games and to win elections, which now took place in more open primary contests rather than behind the scenes closed door party meetings, such a, a, a cheap, affordable medium was very appealing. The following year, in the after, in the after there was another dramatic television event, the televised Senate hearings looking or investigating Watergate. And following the, the prominence that the Senate played because of television in that investigation, Congress studied how to expand its television presence. And thanks to Brian Lamb, a former OTP staffer, uh, he worked um, under, uh, under Clay Whitehead in Nixon's um, OTP. Um, and he then chronicled um, the industry for quite a while as a journalist covering it. He understood that Cable's success depended on being able to help people win re-election. Um, this is some of his writing um, in 1975. And then in the aftermath, this really forged the groundwork for the idea of C-SPAN uh, to really form that relationship between elected officials who are thinking about uh, the legislation that shaped the industry's um, future and the cable um, and the cable and cable programming. And he said in an oral history, and oral histories were another key source that I relied on quite um, frequently because they are very extensive in terms of many of the behind the scenes staffers, as well as more prominent people like Lamb. But he said very directly that if you want to be taken seriously in Washington, um, you have to do something other than entertainment and sports. The way that NBC, uh, CBS and ABC became powerful and, and important was through the news.
And that was really his pitch to get the industry on board uh, to ultimately fund uh, C-SPAN, which the major cable corporations came up with the money um, to underwrite C-SPAN's operations and continue to do to this day. The other source I wanted to share um, is this 1984 cable television political workshop, which I found through the C-SPAN video archives, which is a really important resource for this book and for anyone else thinking about modern American political and media history. And this is the event I opened the book with because it is so compelling and it really does capture um, the key connection between regulatory debates and new strategies of political communication. It happens on March 1st, uh, 1984. The National Cable Television Association held a workshop to extol the political possibilities of cable television. During the event, lobbyists, operators, and programmers all argued that the marketplace would deliver more information that would enhance democracy. Um, and so they framed it as that broadcasting had failed democracy and cable television was going to save it. But they also were a lot more direct and explicit about the benefits of this. It wasn't necessarily for the electorate, although they used that language. All the key lessons that they brought in to, were for campaign advisors um, and staffers and candidates thinking about how to run a campaign and, and to really use a, a cheaper and more malleable form of television. So during this workshop, lobbyists and operators are teaching candidates and their staffers how to build campaigns in the mold of successful cable networks. Um, and so they walk through the very explicit details of what it meant to think about market segmentation, what it meant to think about consumer um, habits as they were making political appeals and to craft them around these ideas of consumption. That's how they were selling their political messages. In the end, Tom Wheeler, uh, the head of the NCTA, gave this re resounding speech, and he promised that the electorate would win because they would have more choice. But there's one slide that's very telling, and and this is um, this comes up during uh, at the end of the the workshop by a market researcher for the cable industry, and that's E equals MC squared. Effectiveness equals more cable. This is telling because it's really about that it's it's about the business of television, that it's about advancing what is good, that it's consuming cable drew people in and it got them to use more and more cable. It was not about mar the democracy. It was about expanding the business of cable television. Certainly, cable programming did bring opportunities for more civic engagement. It brought a diverse perspective or diversity of perspectives to the television dial. But at its core, growing cable was never about advancing democracy. Rather, my research shows how political media from C-SPAN to CNN to MTV's Choose or Lose in the 1992 election were all efforts of a highly regulated industry looking to demonstrate to elected officials why they should encourage rather than limit uh, the growth of cable television. And it's significant that this workshop took place in March of 1984, because it was at the very time that Congress was finalizing and debating um, deregulatory legislation that passed that October that ultimately lifted rate caps on what cable companies could charge, and it streamlined the franchising process to ensure that those who held the franchise would maintain it. And so in the broader book, I argue that cable television, and in particular its political media, knocked down the hierarchies and the rules embedded in the broadcasting era, and in the process created a privatized public sphere, where notions of efficiency and consumer choice reigned supreme, and earlier expectations that corporations had a civic responsibility increasingly faded. There are also consequences for how elected officials interacted with one another and the broader public that we see playing out today. This narrow casting is narrow casting, a narrow casting medium in search of niche audiences. Uh, this presented an opportunity for slicing and dicing the electorate to, by relaying different messages to different audiences. 
It's a targeted approach that represented a seismic transformation from the strategy employed by great communicators of the past, like uh, Franklin Roosevelt or Ronald Reagan, who had used the broadcast media of their day to craft a mass appeal, one that reached and quartered as many Americans as possible. Cable turns this model on its head, um, enabling politicians to issue consensus building efforts in favor of appealing to the quote unquote right demographic. It's a narrow casting approach that was about creating an intimacy between the viewer and the candidate, but that would build loyalties by stressing divisions. I would end by saying that um, despite the subtitle of the book, which ends with Fox News, I did not set out to write a story about Donald Trump um, or Fox News. Indeed, I started writing this book uh, and started thinking about this book in the spring of 2013 when I was actually interviewing for my job here at Purdue. And I learned about the C-SPAN archives that then became such an important um, um, a resource, or resource for my research. But I think what we've seen over the last couple of years, especially what has come out with the Dominion lawsuit against Fox News, that this mutually beneficial relationship between uh, former President Trump and Fox News, um, especially in the way that it put uh, profit and power ahead of democracy, shows the consequences of tethering the democratic process and democratic institutions to the marketplace. Um, more broadly, my goal with this is to show that media and political values, really, they don't just collide, they co-create one another. And I hope that by understanding power dynamics and business calculations and the personal motivations shaping uh, the information that we, can, we consume and how we consume it can help people better navigate a political and media environment designed to distract and divide them. Thank you so much. Catherine, thank you. Now, our first discussant this afternoon is Margaret O'Mara, who's a political and economic historian of the modern United States and the Scott and Dorothy Bullitt Chair of American History at the University of Washington. She's the author of The Code, Silicon Valley and the Remaking of America, published by Penguin Press in 2019, Pivotal Tuesdays, Four Elections That Shaped the 20th Century, University of Pennsylvania Press in 2015, and Cities of Knowledge, Cold War Science and the Search for the Next Silicon Valley, published by Princeton in 2005. Her writing and commentary have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wired, MIT Technology Review, Foreign Affairs, and other outlets. Margaret, welcome to the seminar. Thank you so much, Eric. And thank you, uh, Katie Brunell, for, for making this marvelous, marvelous book. It's so exciting to see it um, out in the world and to and it's something that I think is an extraordinarily important contribution for, for a number of reasons. Um, I should start by saying I, um, I'm particularly pleased to be commenting as the Bullet Chair of American History and the Bullet Family. This chair is, is endowed by the family, uh, the, the matriarchy, in fact, that that founded King, uh, the King News uh, TV and Radio Empire out here in uh, in Washington in Seattle. So there is a there's a, a TV angle to everything. Um, there are many delightful things about this book. And before I talk about the historiographic contributions, I want to just begin by um, highlighting the, all the wonderful stories and the cast of characters that are here and, and the incredible sweep that at beginning in the 1940s with these very scrappy, uh, not very politically savvy cable operators um, with these stations and these, you know, literally people climbing on the roof to erect antenna um, at a time at the very beginning of television itself. I hadn't fully appreciated until I read this book how old cable is and how and how it is something that has been around as long as television itself. And this, I think, actually feeds into one of the really big um, contributions and insights of this book um, that gets us to think not just about cable, but more broadly about the policy making process, um, which is that cable news and the efforts, particularly our cable, the cable industry and news and the and C-SPAN and the public 
service um, elements of it, were designed to be a solution to a problem and a problem of a concentration of power um, in just three big networks. And that concentration included if you were in Astoria, Oregon, or even early on in some place like Seattle, Washington, you couldn't necessarily get all the programming you could get in New York. <laughs> um, there was, and true for most of rural America or most of America, pretty much, that cable was fixing this problem, opening things up. And also the, the push starting in the 1970s that Katie so beautifully documents in this book is really a bipartisan very earnest push to open up the information ecosystem. Does that sound familiar? To dislodge the power of a few big companies that seem to have control, these platform companies that have control over the sources of information. And in doing that, their intent, in, indeed, a thousand channels literally bloom. And there now are different networks and outlets and news programs for everyone. But in splitting up that larger whole, that mass public, you no longer had the imperative, as you point out in this book, to deliver a message that would resonate with the masses or something that would be um, across, appealing to the full political spectrum. Indeed, you know, one of the great um, opportunities and, and realities that Cable created was freeing up this information ecosystem, but it also allowed, um, uh, as you document in the books, this, pol this polarization. The, the other thing that is related to this, which is, you know, Fox News is in your subtitle. And when we think of, when we think of fragmentation and pol political polarization and cable, we do think of the present day media environment, the cable news environment, Fox News, but also MSNBC, and also the kind of the political, the, the, in order to make money in cable news, you have to be um, uh, having a significant point of view and, and saying it loudly. And that what this shows is that this did not begin, we did not begin with that, that there's a much deeper history. And there's a particularly, I particularly appreciate um, for, for those who are um, both uh, lived through and are scholars of um, the 1970s, I think this, there's a particular, um, particularly important contribution here in looking at what the next administration is doing with media that goes beyond the enemies list, that goes beyond what we, the stories we know, that's about, that's linked to this broader push to, towards privatization, towards a kind of early, um, you know, de-linking these, um, you know, the gov get, getting government control out of out of media and creating a more free freewheeling business environment, but also extended to other um, other industries as well. And and that is, um, and but it also because it's Richard Nixon, it's deliciously wrapped up in all of the <laughs> the the, uh, the psychology of the Nixon the Nixon administration. Um, and I, I think that that this is, you know, I think you're very conscious and conscientious about making this is not a cable news book. But this explains cable news, but it explains that cable as an industry, as a source of information, has, um, you know, it, it was, you know, the, it, it definitely vastly enlarged choice and certainly allowed messages of um, difference and identity to spread more widely. Um, I think, and I think as a, as a Gen Xer about MTV and how MTV broadcasts to a national audience of teenagers in the 1980s what life is like on the coast or in London or the punk scene or all of these alternative identities, um, queer identities, things that were not something that was part of the mainstream pop culture. You know, here's something that cable is able to do, and it's able to do this in multiple ways and in different in different. So there's there's a, a story that you tell there that is um, can be very affirmative at the same time. They're occurring in an already an age of information overload, a term that was coined by Alvin Toffler in 1970, well before any of this really started get, getting going. It allowed for this, the siloing that we, that we see today. I was um, thinking about, um, as I, because I write about the tech industry, obviously so many things about this book sort of resonated with what I know and what we all experience in terms of the, the evolution of the internet as an, a media and a political force and a business force. Uh, there are so many echoes in the 1984 hearing um, that you opened the book with and that you show a, a, a freeze frame of today, um, of this hopefulness of what cable could provide and this democratic promise of cable that is so exciting. 
it reminds me a lot of, oh, wasn't that long ago, although it seems very long ago, in the postmortem write-ups after Obama's election in 2008 and the Obama campaign's use of Facebook and particularly Facebook, but other social media, and how much, and it's not too hard, folks, you can Google it now, it's still up there on the, online, all of these news analyses that were saying, holy cow, social media has this incredible democratic potential to allow people to have their, you know, to speak and have a voice and be heard in a way that they had not been heard before. And um, and certainly, indeed, it did. And this, of course, was the, the um, techno-optimistic uh, hopes that Silicon Valley's the designers and the creators of these platforms had. They really honestly, very earnestly believed that bringing the world online was going to indeed make the world a better place. And you and many beautiful things have bloomed online. And yet when you bring humanity online, all the worst of humanity comes along with the, with the best and it can serve to amplify it particularly. And I think this is another really important resonance is that when it's an industry and when the point of this is this is to make money at the end of the day, that is what trumps everything. And that we've seen this with, you know, the social platforms as one example of consumer facing tech, where when these harms of algorithmic news feeds and um, targeting and whatever are, are raised at the end of the day, and, and some, sometimes being raised from within the companies themselves, if, if any changes that are made to the platform that would dramatically decrease advertiser revenue, which is their source of revenue, that can't happen. And that is not necessarily because there are malevolent tech overlords at the top of things. I'll, you know, people can come to their own judgments, but I see people who are C-suite executives who are accountable to shareholders and they're working as capital capitalism, you know, encourages them to do. Um, and they'll get in trouble with their boards if they don't do this. We, you know, had a vivid example of, you know, boards and CEOs not getting along this weekend. Uh, so there's a there's a real you know this tension I think is a really important um, you know it's very easy for us to say well can't cable news or cable fix itself or can't the, this this that or the other the media environment fix itself and showing these this long evolution I think mean, first understanding this long history is really important as a starting point and I'm understanding how the the market imperatives were not only um, you know that they were driving so many of these actors towards us, but also that this was something that leaders of both parties were really encouraging. This is all part of this broader move towards um, deregulation, to, to opening up. And this isn't something that's a pure, we can't see this through a purely partisan lens. There's a really interesting, um, the other thing I appreciate about this book is the cast of characters includes people who are coming at this from all points of the political spectrum. I mean, there's kind of the public interest, Ralph Naderite types who are interested in more transparency and again, getting more actors into the market. There are the, um, you know, more conservative, and I'm sure Nikki, you'll talk to this, of the conservative voices who feel like they've been frozen out of the media ecosystem and need to have, you know, some, some ability to have free speech or have their speech be heard. And there, you know, there is not a clear cut um, you know, there are there are never any clear cut heroes or villains. But this also is something that I think is really because you give us all food for thought, particularly when it comes to reform and policy aimed to reform things. As is, you know, there are can be unintended consequences. It does happen in a broader ecosystem. And having this fuller appreciation for this medium that you've done so carefully, and the sourcing and the rigor and the work that's come into this is just so impressive. So it's really. Um, a really a triumphal book. And I'm so excited that it's coming out. And also, I think it's a really especially useful read as we enter yet another presidential um, election cycle when all of this will be ever more pertinent. So thank you for writing this book. And I'm delighted to um, be part of this conversation. Margaret, thank you. Uh, Katie, any thoughts or responses that you'd like to offer at this point before we move on? Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for your kind words and careful reading of the book, because uh, I mean, there are many things uh, that you hit on, but I that it, we can talk for hours <laughs> about. But, you know, I think one of the, the things that 
you know, the business interests. I think that's something that I had to really learn um, more about kind of these business structures. And, you know, someone like John Malone was so interesting and in his battle, you know, so he's the head of TCI, this major cable corporation that just explodes in the aftermath of deregulation in 84. And he and Al Gore go head to head. Um, and, and it's really, he, he just can't understand why he has to apologize for making money. And, and, you know, he's like, well, I'm, I'm making money. Why do you, do you want me to apologize for, you know, these profits and, and that tension that, you know, there is an industry that's making an argue, a pol like a lobbying argument about democracy, because this kind of helps the, the policy issue to show that they can contribute when this entire regulatory system was hinged on this notion of the public interest, right? That broadcasters would contribute to the public interest. And so their businesses had to be kind of protected. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, the cable comes in just saying we're, we're gonna make money and not not apologize and so a lot of these regulatory conflicts and legislative con uh, conflicts happen when it becomes clear that the business interest and these democratic initiatives are at odds with one another um and that's what really will draw out some of these really heated battles um between figures like Malone and Al Gore and I think that's something that I did not appreciate when I when I began um this this broader project and also thinking that uh, to your point about deregulation as a bipartisan issue, when I started writing this book, I thought that cable was a product of Ronald Reagan, uh, his administration. And, and in fact, um, it goes, it's a lot deeper. People like Jimmy Carter played a huge role. Um, and, um, and so, uh, and, and other, other Democrats throughout the 1980s as well. And so really kind of shifting the focus um, from Reagan and deregulation opened up so many new people um, and perspectives that kind of showed the long and more nuanced battle um, over the, the nature of cable television. Thank you. Before we continue, let me just remind those of you in the audience that if you wish to pose a question, you can get in the queue now, no need to wait. Um, and you can pose that question once again by using the raise hand function in Zoom, in which case you have to unmute yourself when we call on you. And you can pose the question directly with your own voice, or you can use the Q&A function in Zoom, in which case I get to read the question that you post there. All right. Our second commentator this afternoon is Nicole Hemmer, an associate professor of history and director of the Carolyn T. and Robert M. Rogers Center for the American Presidency at Vanderbilt University. She received her PhD in U.S. history from Columbia University and is the author of Messengers of the Right, Conservative Media and the Transformation of American Politics, published in 2016, and Partisans, the Conservative Revolutionaries Who Remade American Politics in the 1990s, published in 2022. Both books were subjects of the Washington History Seminar, the first back when we were in person at the Wilson Center in that pre-COVID era, and the second here in our online format. Nicole, welcome back to the seminar. Well, thank you so much for having me, and thank you for all the work that you all have done to keep the Washington History Seminar up and running through these changing times. It's also great um, to be able to be here with Katie and Margaret. Um, our work all sort of circles around one another. We're interested in these questions of technology and media and politics and their relationship to democratic governance. And we come at it from very different ways. Um, but I think that being in conversation with one another, especially about this brilliant book um, is, is such a treat. Um, and I, I'm gonna pose my comments around kind of the bigger political world that Katie illuminates through this study of, of cable. Because like Katie, I am very dedicated to this proposition that media and politics co-create one another in the United States, um, that our media system reflects our politics, that our politics reflect our media systems, but it does more than just reflect, right? It They, they can constitute one another in really important ways that often are not well understood um, because I don't think that traditionally media has been taken seriously enough as a political institution. And what Katie does in this book is she takes media very seriously as a political institution, as an industry, as a set of actors in a way that I think really enriches not only our understanding of 
this particular medium, um, but of politics itself. And it's that that I want to focus on today. Because I think that Americans have gotten used to thinking about media and democracy through the lens of social media, right? Um, I think there were some uh, grimaces about the idea that Facebook was once this techno-optimistic space um, because now it has become so common to focus on Facebook and Twitter and TikTok as threats to free and fair elections, to good political information, and just to democratic governance more generally. Um, so I think we're used to thinking about this relationship between media and governance when it comes to social media, but I think we're a little less accustomed to thinking about how that has functioned with some of these earlier technologies. Um, people rail against cable news, um, like Fox and CNN or MSNBC, but I think when they do, they're primarily focused on the news side of cable news and not the cable side. And I think what this book does is it reminds us that the cable side is actually really important for understanding both the potential of cable news and the disruptive consequences of it and of cable more generally. Um, so this is where Katie is very deeply researched and this is such a deeply researched book and also very smartly argued book comes in. I, I think cable in addition to being ignored when we think about democracy also gets somewhat ignored um, when we think about media history. It's certainly overshadowed by our focus on broadcast media or digital media. But 24-7 politics makes clear why we actually should be paying a lot of attention to cable, because cable was such a consequential technology. Um, from the start, as Katie points out, it was intertwined with these questions of democracy, um, not just with this idea that cable could be a public service, um, but that also it came with fears of fragmentation, of fracturing. And it is also, as we've just touched upon, a story of capitalism and how capitalism and democracy intersect in particular ways in the latter half of the 20th century. And so I wanna focus on some of these big ideas that emerge from the book. And then I'll throw out a couple of questions as well. So first, I am particularly struck by how the promise of cable is the promise of a market-driven democracy. It is this sort of techno-utopian project backed by industrialists and politicians who have a strong faith in the private market. And this is a vision of democracy that I feel like has, has been dominant um, for the last 40 or 50 years. And, it, you know, it might be challenged today, but it still has pretty significant sway in the U.S. And what I particularly love about this book is that people talk about things like neoliberalism or market-driven liberalism, but we don't necessarily always get these kind of nitty-gritty studies of what that looks like on the ground. And that is what this book offers. It gives us an opportunity to really dig into the granular processes that made this form of politics function. We've got deregulation, we've got public-private partnerships, and we've also got this values-driven rhetoric that just coincidentally neatly aligns with underlying economic interests. Um, so even if Cable um, doesn't ultimately, wasn't pursued earnestly um, to advance democracy by all of these groups, that rhetoric um, that markets are going to provide the best form of democracy is something that really resonated um, over the past half century. Um, it also clarifies a vision of democracy, as Katie was saying earlier, that's defined by choice and consumption, right? The, the freedom to choose from a range of options is what defines democracy. And that is something that is not only true of the politics of the last 50 years in the U.S., but the last 100 years in the U.S., right? The, the debates that were being had in the U.S., um, during the Cold War. Part of them were like, look, America is a better place. Democracy is a better thing because we have all of these choices. And Americans can consume um, sort of broadly um, from this big range in a way that Soviets cannot. Um, and that is, that is sort of uh, uh, evidence of why our, our governing system is better. And I think related to this, in a way, something that comes out in the book that I don't think we've touched on yet, is that there is an interest in diversification that doesn't significantly challenge those underlying economic interests. These cable innovators were interested, the politicians and the industry people, um, in empowering minority communities in a couple of different ways by 
providing representation, but also providing ownership in this in this technological space in a way that the broadcast network model didn't, right? If you only have three channels, um, it is unlikely first that you're going to have um, opportunities for ownership in general beyond just a few people, um, but also that you're going to be broadcasting content um, that is aimed at a, at a group of people who might represent 10% of the population or 15% of the population. Um, so what you get with cable is the emergence of outlets like Black Entertainment Television, the Gay Cable Network uh, that Katie writes about, the Spanish International Network. And yet notably, the diversification that's happening in cable is not happen happening at this time in the upper echelons of the cable industry, right? The people who are getting filthy rich in the cable industry, um, which Katie points out, was sort of continue to be uh, be white men, although there are new opportunities, um, particularly under Carter, uh, to focus on minority-owned businesses in the cable industry. I'd like to call attention to a few other things that I think Katie's book draws out um, that are really clarifying about politics in the United States. First, her book is a reminder that exposure politics is not new, that the attention economy doesn't emerge with social media. Um, she has these great vignettes from the 1950s. Um, you have members of Congress who are complaining about show horses versus work horses. You have somebody like Joe McCarthy, who is manipulating the media environment in order to get attention with grand and false statements um, that get him both attention and get him power. The role of particular forms of media in incentivizing incendiary politics has been with us for a long time. Um, it certainly was accelerated by cable. It was accelerated again by social media. But I think understanding that it is not just a product of the social media era helps us understand, first of all, just helps us understand the attention economy more, but also why it's so difficult to counter because it is so deeply rooted in American politics. The other thing that I'd like to talk about is something that I found in my, my recent book as well that Katie traces really beautifully. For all of the attention and criticism that's heaped on cable news, it's not the only form of cable programming that has shaped our politics. Um, Katie mentioned the Choose or Lose initiative on MTV. Um, Rock the Vote would come along a little later. By the 1990s, both MTV and Comedy Central, which are two channels that have no natural connection to electoral politics, are firmly in the programming space around elections. Um, not just MTV, but you know, Comedy Central covers both conventions in 1992. That leads to um, the creation of Bill Maher's Politically Incorrect, which is on cable for a few years before it moves into um, into network television. Um, then you get The Daily Show and The Colbert Report. And suddenly you have these non-cable news cable channels that are providing pretty important programming when it comes to shaping American politics. Um, they're going to change the political culture in the U.S. They're going to shape political incentives for politicians running for office. I think we would be much less surprised at the success of a star of a reality TV host uh, thriving in U.S. politics if we had a clear understanding of these historical developments, um, which I think makes Katie's book pretty important. Uh, even though you didn't mean to write a book to help explain the age of Trump, I think that it is a necessary component of understanding um, the, the intersection of politics um, and media in the U.S. today. So that leads me to just a couple of questions um, that I have for you. One is I'm just very curious what you make of this turn toward politics from these non-political cable channels. I mean, is it, is it something inherent in the cable model that would push um, these, these networks to engage in politics? Is it something about cable consumers? Um, that there was a sense that, oh, cable watchers, that they really, they really want more politics um, mixed in with everything that they're doing. Um, and the other question that I have for you, I, I do this trick with my graduate students, um, uh, this idea that the last line of every book tells you why the author wrote it. <laughs> and I feel like your book actually holds up pretty well to that, but it also raised a question um, that I would love to hear you respond to. So for those who don't have their copy uh, and are not following along uh, at home, the last line of this book 
Instead of a richer democracy, one with better educated Americans who debate issues and hear from politicians in depth, Cable has delivered a divided, polarized, angry America where people doom scroll on their favorite social media platform, another segment at Marketplace, controlled by various private businesses and their agendas. First of all, I think that's a great summary of your book. Second of all, I was I was uh, struck by the kind of parenthetical uh, reference to social media as another segmented marketplace. And I was wondering how you think about the relationship between cable and social media. Do you see it um, sort of the same process of change that's happening in the electorate more broadly? Or do you see it, cable as sort of setting the stage for social media, that it provides kind of a model for what social media will become? I would just love to hear your thoughts on that too. Well, thank you so much, um, again, for such a thoughtful and generous questions and uh, such a close reading to the book. It's wonderful when people actually get what you wrote or what you wanted to write and understand kind of the, the broader contributions um, that I wanted to make with this work. Um, I'll start with the second question first, because I I wrote that line. I, I finished the manuscript and sent it off in November of 2022. Um, and so it was due, it was actually right this weekend, it was right before Thanksgiving that I sent the final manuscript off. And it's right as, I just remember thinking, watching all, it was right as Elon Musk had bought Twitter. And I was watching that all of a sudden, you know, people, I recognize that people had come to rely on Twitter for these forms of community, for their businesses, for their professional identity. Um, and watching that all of a sudden fall apart because a new person bought it and it was trying to impose a particular vision for it was really striking to me. Um, and so th that's that's one thing that was on my mind as I was writing that final line. But I, I think it does go to kind of both the point that you and Margaret had about that cable does set the stage for what we see with social media. Um, there is that flowering, right? Like that excitement that this, you know, that, that techno optimism that absolutely flourished in the aftermath of um, the 20, uh, 2008 election and Obama's victory. But it follows that you've got these private industries that are shaping these, that the communities are being forged. Um, new ideas, um, again, new possibilities are there, but all of those connect, uh, connections are forged on the terrain of private business. Um, that they do control the rules and those rules are going to serve their bottom line rather than like this democratic promise that so many people have with them. So I think that cable does break the mold in terms of, how people are thinking about media um, and political media in particular, uh, shifting away from the broadcasting model where there's again, this expectation that businesses because of regulations um, have to serve the public interest um, and, and that they can be concentrated and big as long as they do that. Again, so much unhappiness with that, very elitist, very exclusionary, and then it really pushes to let's make these businesses, um, you know, to, to break them up, to decentralize them. And in many ways, the product is decentralized, right? So now we have all sorts of different programs. All You can find any kind of podcast or YouTube show. You can find any kind of content that you want, but they're still controlled by major corporations, right? That, um, And so I think that there's a sense that, yes, it's decentralized, and in some capacities, it certainly is. Um, but there's still this corporate structure that has triumphed. Um, and so I think that those are those are kind of the tensions that are there. But Cable does introduce this notion um, of diversity defined by choice, right? By consumer choice that is not as much of a factor under broadcasting. Um, and that is very much this idea of fragmentation as a positive, um, that they, they celebrate it, that it's a fragmentation because it's a decentralization and it allows more consumer choice. And I think that social media um, has really developed in that vein and those defining values are still very much what shaping um, how people are thinking about it, how they're using it, but also the business structures that are behind it. I love that you brought up, um, uh, I share this uh, this interest in political entertainment media and kind of its role in politics. It's something that I've thought a lot about with uh, both of my books. And, and I think one of the most interesting and surprising um, archival finds I had was looking at the 1992 election and realizing why MTV got involved. And, and this is, you know, 
these stories you can't make up. Uh, it, and it, it's just one of those really interesting things, the irony of it, um, is that MTV got involved um, because uh, in the 92 election for a variety of different factors, but there are two um, main uh, reasons why they get involved. First, the broader cable industry is going a debate about re-regulation that Al Gore is leading. Um, Al Gore is demonizing the, the big bad cable companies like John Malone as, you know, raising rates um, and in taking advantage of consumers. Um, and so there, Al Gore introduces cable re-regulation to, re to, to re-regulate the industry and introduce rate caps again. So there's this big battle over regulation and kind of was deregulation in 84 a good idea? Al Gore is leading the way. Um, it's really how he boosts his uh, national profile in the late 80s and early 90s. And the cable industry, the, um, the, the main lobbying industry, encourages all different types of cable programmers to get involved in the election uh, by, by showing that cable can do good, right? It can, it can serve this role, um, uh, th this public service element, that it can, it can really enhance democracy because of this broader regulatory debate. And so that's the, one of the main reasons that MTV decides to try it. And, and the irony is that MTV is the, the, the program, um, the, 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 the choose or lose programming, it really helps bolster Clinton and Gore's um, ticket and really is a key factor in how they they uh, revamped their campaign in 92 and ended up winning the White House. So again, the irony here is so fascinating. Um, but there's another factor that I think is really important too. And I think this goes to why a, a Comedy Central embraces politics and why other, Nickelodeon, right, even had a little political angle, um, is that an MTV executive in one interview was uh, anonymous, would not give his name uh, or her name, uh, but likely him, um, but was very direct that it was good business that it said very directly, this executive said, we do not want our viewer turning the channel to get their information about the election. So we're going to deliver a personalized version that is of the interest to what we think our viewer wants to keep them engaged. And so what we now would call echo chambers, uh, political media and entertainment media realized early on that this is very profitable. That if we can keep them from turning the, the channel by giving them not just all of the information, but information personalized, uh, political information personalized to them, that it will keep them loyal to the, that cable network. Um, and it worked. Um, in the aftermath of 92, um, it's everyone, um, all the, the, the networks, the, the broadcast networks are trying to think about how to keep people tuned in with expansive uh, political programming that blends entertainment. By 96, so much of political media had followed uh, the model that MTV introduced in 92, including Comedy Central, of course, right? <laughs> Thank you. Let's open this up to the audience. We have a number of folks who have been very patiently waiting with their hands raised. So we're going to call on um, one of them just disappeared. Um, Elizabeth Shermer, um, you are up. Please unmute. Pose your question comment. Hi, thanks to everyone involved um, with this great um, seminar. I really enjoyed having a chance to zoom in and listen in both to about Katie talk about her book, but also that amazing commentary from both Nikki and Margaret. So my question is, you know, it's interesting, the social media angle that everyone sort of brought up because social media is usually conflated with the death of cable and that it's sort of slow demise. And especially thinking about it's really kind of not just social media, but also the streaming platforms. Um, and that usually who's having cable these days is those 65 and older. So I'm wondering, Katie, if you saw in your work an aspect of wonders, wondering about the politics and especially that sort of anger and hate that you talked about with Richard Nixon or actually how the industry itself was regulated or not regulated and took shape to help us understand why there would be this space. Is it just the technology um, space for actually the streaming platforms and also actually the the, the social media platforms in, uh, as well to show us the clips and things like that to sort of suck off on it like they're more well known to be doing for newspapers um, in the 90s and early aughts. So thanks again for a great session. Thank you so much, Ellie, for um, such a terrific question. And 
You know, it's I, I think that that is the common narrative. And certainly um, social media streaming platforms are challenging the, the business model of cable television. They're very much challenging the business model of cable news. Um, and, and as people are kind of turning to other places to get even more personalized um, information. And so it's one of the things that I actually spoke with. Um, I did a fellowship before COVID shut everything down um, at the Cable Center in Denver. And I spoke with a lot of executives about how they felt about streaming and the future of cable. And for them, they've diversified their assets. <laughs> it's a very corporate way of saying it. But, you know, so they they were as as concerned because um, uh, many of them have invested in the 5G um, networks and that's th they're really banking on owning the hardwire that then enables all of this digital world to exist, that owning that is is the future. Um, so it's really, so I think that the, you definitely see it's going to be a change in the business model, um, I, I, but I think it will, it will it will continue in some capacity, but it's now more closely. And I'd love to hear Margaret's thoughts on this too, because the connection between cable companies and internet companies, they, they merge in the late nineties after the telecommunications act. Um, and now all of a sudden they they're invested in one another. Um, the interesting thing is with the programming is that, you know, now cable networks uh, like HBO uh, now now pe they they are relying on a direct subscriber model, uh, and so I think that means cultivating this loyalty with viewers is even more important than it was before. Um, pr previously, some someone like HBO would you you'd pay your cable bill, um, and part of uh, how you would get HBO was a more premium panel or channel, so you would pay a little bit extra. But something like ESPN was built into the carriage rates. And and so, again, think now you have to rely on individuals to make up that money that you aren't necessarily getting from the cable operators and their monthly cable bills that they charge then give you 50 cents uh, per subscriber. So I think the business calculations are really interesting, um, but I think the companies will continue to try to find ways. And even thinking about subscription, right, companies are raising the rates. Um, uh, time, you know, it's getting more expensive to, for for Netflix and Hulu, and these are not linked to perhaps traditional cable companies, but they're very much following that model of subscription and trying to, you know, have that loyalty with individuals um, in a way that you know really expands on that business model of um, that cable introduced. Mm -hmm. Margaret, what do you think about the connection between cable companies and internet companies? <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot. I think it's really interesting. And then, and then in fact, the kind of same regulatory, deregulatory impulse is kind of, I mean, you know, the story you tell in your book is really creating the big, big, wide, flat, friendly runway for internet companies to grow. And, and to the, you know, the Al Gore's war on the telecoms was in part fueled because he was talking to early internet evangelists about the importance of having a more free information ecosystem. These are all, all these things are very intertwined with one another. Um, I think that the question's really interesting because, well, one, what we're seeing already is, you know, a, a continued proliferation of outlets. And, um, and, and this kind of speaks a bit to some of what Nikki's comments were, were pointing out, which is that there's, we sort of have this dissonance in American politics and, and American society more broadly, and that we have 40 years or so, or particularly the last 30 years of kind of increased um, social visibility and tolerance of difference or more diversity, visual diversity, kind of the, um, you know, what we all roll our eyes when we kind of open a, a website and see all the canned stock photos of a diverse group of people like laughing at an office or something. And that, but the actual, you know, corporate hierarchy is not that diverse. Um, that dissonance is kind of the same. We have this diverse, very diverse information ecosystem that's catering to a lot of different niche interests. And yet there's this, the business imperative, and we're seeing this in streaming, is that if you have too many outlets, that the, the, the business is no good. So, you know, it, there's going to be a drive towards consolidation, just like we've seen in the technology platforms. And, you know, part of it is because it's very expensive to, to run these things. The infrastructure itself is very expensive. And, um, but, you know, that's, a, you know, whereas the, 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 the companies, you've talked about the lack of diversity in the industry itself, even though the, the products are very diverse. So I think that there's that that tension there. There's kind of, the, you know, we, we, this is an insight, a broader political insight into how America has become a more open and tolerant place um, legally and socially. 
And at the same time, there has been a rem remarkable stasis at the top. And it, I guess the last the last point I want to make that's prompted by this question as well as earlier remarks is that, you know, this is all happening at the same time that faith in institutions, governmental and otherwise, is declining. And this is taking, you know, this kind of open, you know, choose your own adventure in terms of media consumption and political consumption is something that's all happening at the backdrop of people not believing in the capacity of government to properly take care of things or the capacity of societal institutions that were dominant um, to have capacity to take care of things. So that's, you know, all these things flow together in really, really interesting and important ways. And just to add one other thing, um, because Ellie, you mentioned the average age of cable news viewers. You know, when MSNBC, which of course was a, a partnership between Microsoft and NBC, because this new cable news network really wanted to take advantage of this new technology and because of all of the deregulatory um, uh, issues that Katie was talking about, it really positioned itself as the network for Gen X. They had like the um, exposed brick in the background. They were all sitting around their own little central perk set um, because it was supposed to speak to like 20 somethings. And I think that it did um, 20 somethings of the nineties potentially. Um, but, you know, as technologies change and as new generations of young people don't have a cable news habit, I think they've really struggled to keep those viewers and these, uh, you know, a channel that was was born to serve 20 somethings sort of um, aged out of its own ideal demographic. Thank you. Let me let me squeeze in a question here, if if I may. And it has to do with the notion of techno optimism and the notion of democracy. And at various times in your book, you have different parties using the language of democracy. We are going to expand the electorate, going to have more voices, more diverse voices taking part, and democracy will be healthier as a result. Maybe it's because we're in 2023 and our cynicism level is, I don't know, kind of up here. Um, so I'm trying to recreate that mindset and I'm having a very hard time doing it, except insofar as the language of democracy always sounds good, but I have trouble kind of imagining actual people on the ground thinking that this is going to do it. So you have a case in the early 60s um, of uh, a battle in California uh, between free TV and pay TV. Um, uh, and with the free TV people saying, you know, cable is going to be, they don't use this word, exclusionary. It's going to be an economic burden on the poor and how terrible this is. But on the other side, you have a variety of, of organizations, obviously cable promoters, but also Americans for Democratic Action, um, you know, who, who say, you know, no, this is going to be able to expand various voices. Um, they lose this time, but they continue and later in the 1960s, you talk about engineers at the Rand Corporation, researchers at the Ford Foundation, producing studies that envisioned how cable television could provide meaningful social change and help combat economic inequality and racial injustice. And a whole variety of, of progressive groups kind of get on board. Um, I'm trying to recreate their thinking here and why they would really believe um, that that this would be the case. You know, yes, more voices might be available somewhere on the dial, but but would this, did they really believe that this was going to reduce economic inequality? Uh, how? Um, or even uh, reduce racial injustice? Again, how? So if you could just bring us into the mindset uh, of those liberals or progressives who believed that this corporate dominated technology was somehow going to make this a better world for everyone. I was just looking at my bookshelf to see if I can find this book, um, but it's by uh, Ralph Lee Smith. Uh, who writes The Wired Nation. Um, it comes out in 1970. And he basically, he makes this argument, and it, this is an argument that people then reference time and time again. And so it's an argument that takes root in a lot of liberal and progressive circles. But basically thinking that the problem with the great society, right, the problem with liberalism is, is an information or is a technological issue. So I think it's a way of kind of 
not focusing on the deep roots of certain problems and say, let's just focus, the, the technology will save it, right? We don't have to really fundamentally restructure society to get more equity and justice. We're just going to have the, techno the technology will come in and save it. And so I think there's, there's a way to not really look at the deeper issue by focusing on this notion of techno-optimism. Uh, but he does lay out in this short book um, a variety of ways in which um, he calls it the, the New Deal for the Information Age, that the, he, he's really pushing the federal government to develop the infrastructure for cable television, knowing that it could deliver television, but it could also deliver education. Um, it could... Um, uh, it could deliver lectures on certain things, job training. It could um, it could bring more um, access to finances, um, and so it could then create a conversation between local um, individuals and city councils um, to get, help people be more informed. And so there is this. I mean, and people, some people truly did believe it. Um, and whether or not their vision could have ever become a reality, it would have created a massive, I mean, he, but he calls on the federal government to invest in building this wired nation of, you know, the wires for cable infrastructure, just the way that they had built the highway system. Um, seeing that the exchange of ideas is going to be at the core of the information society. And, and you know, to... It, I, I thought a lot about cables develop and the very specific policies and visions that were promoted for the um, building, like the actual infrastructure of cable. And I, I thought a lot about Margaret's work as I was writing this and how how different it was um, for kind of the investment in you know Cold War computing um, that she um, so so brilliantly ex excavates in all of her work, and that you know the, the government would would subsidize um, certain um, experiments going on in um, in uh, in. Silicon Valley, but it didn't with cable television. And I think that's really interesting. There were calls to do that, uh, but they were calls in 1969 and 1970. And this is not something that Richard Nixon really wanted. Um, and so I think that's where I, where Nixon was so transformative um, as a figure, because he really kind of shut down even more investigation into those. Um, think tanks would continue to expand some of the research into it. Um, a lot of them funded by foundations um, and thinking about, you know, is there a different economic structure um, that could decentralize information in ways that allowed people to challenge this concentration of, um, of ideas and information that was held with the, the networks. But ultimately, uh, they, they just really didn't gain a lot of ground um, in this more um, market-driven vision um, triumphed. I don't know if you have anything to add, Margaret, too, about kind of these these broader, the, 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 the visions, right? And how, what what's, the possibilities for cable, how it, it to me, it was always striking and in, in doing this work, thinking about how different it was for the, the economic and political development of, of the technology sector that you studied. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's all part of the broader, you know, this broader question about communications in general happening at the same time in the late sixties and the seventies, this is debate over commuter, computer communication and should, it wasn't the internet then, it was the phone lines that were connected computers to computers, but um, should that be a model just like tele voice telephony? Um, should there be a regulated monopoly or should the government be stepping in and creating, as it did happen in Europe, a digital infrastructure to deliver this? And again, like just exactly like you're saying, these are all the same conversations. And, and so that does become something that's much, it's this window into really understanding our information environment writ large, that these different platforms and media and the infrastructure underneath them and the political debates about them are coming, you know, very much one and the same. And they are coming from a very progressive place as well um, as, a, as a as a liberal place. A leftist, the left, the liberals and, and the, um, and the right are in many ways aligning around this notion of, um, you know, are, are all engaged in these conversations and they're kind of coming at it from their own, seeing these platforms as a means to an end. Um, but then it's, it's very much, you know, this is, this book so much exp explains our media environment, including our internet media environment writ large in many ways. It's not just, not only cable. 
there's something so cyclical, cyclical about it, which is interesting because you see this when new technologies emerge. Katie, you mentioned the New Deal, like with radio. Um, there's this moment at the beginning of radio that it it is infused with all of this democratic potential. And then by the end of the 1930s, as you have more and more demagogues on um, radio, people are like, well, maybe we have we have miscalculated a little bit about the, the democratic potential of this medium. And so you see it with cable, you see it with um, social media, Media and with the internet, um, that there's all of this hope and real and real democratization that these technologies do, but then um, the the full scope of the potential of that medium uh, comes home to roost in a way, um, and suddenly people lose some of that optimistic sheen. Thank you. We have a number of questions in the queue and several uh, address or raise the question about kind of the demographics of those who run this industry. Um, it has been stated, one anonymous attendee writes, that the top hierarchy of the cable industry is predominantly white male dominated. Is there evidence that this is changing? I've heard that more than one minority cable company buyer has been pushed out of purchasing certain cable companies. Uh, and another uh, uh, audience member asks about women uh, and their uh, absence uh, in positions of leadership uh, in the cable industry. Yeah, it's, it's a question I thought a lot about. Um, I, and, you know, it is it was very striking to see, you know, just how much of the, the, the business operations, but also policy conversations, you know, what's happening at the FCC, the staffers in the White House that are kind of thinking through um, different policy that it is so um, male dominated. Um, and, and this is it, it, it was really it was a striking thing. Um, but there are, and this is where you, again, the late 70s, the early 80s, there's this flowering of possibilities that we've talked about that, you know, these are cable companies that are trying to figure out some kind of innovative program that they could put out. And so all of a sudden they're thinking about um, women as consumers, right? Like that they want to kind of uh, build an audience of women uh, consumers. And then they think, oh, we need to have a news program dedicated towards them. And so then there's an opportunity. Um, you know, I, I tell this story of uh, a woman, uh, Maureen Orth, who became involved in this kind of hippie um, experimental project to cover the 72 convention. Um, it's really fascinating um, and really kind of upend the traditions of journalism um, by just having a camera, a mobile camera that they could carry on there with a backpack and interviewing new people, really kind of challenging those, those conventions um, introduced by someone like Walter Cronkite, uh, bringing new voices, new perspectives, um, and really does an excellent job um, uh, in, in, in covering a true diversity of perspectives um, and asking unconventional questions, going outside the convention hall, not just relying on who's speaking, right, but actually getting protesters. Um, and then she goes on to work for um, a news, uh, um, a daytime news uh, program that's dedicated towards uncovering um, issues for of interest for women. And it really propels her career. She goes on to do many other things later on in her career. And cable was a really a, a terrific opportunity for her to kind of climb up that ladder that is was so male dominated. And you see that in a variety of, uh, there are a couple other women that I have found that got into companies that were looking for new ideas and were willing to experiment. HBO was actually really interesting in this capacity uh, because it was a pay channel uh, where people paid extra for it. It could gamble um, on doing, you know, on hiring um, uh, uh, different different Black executives, having, having a program for women uh, to support and mentor one another. And so it, HBO is really interesting in terms of how it, it did want, it recognized that diversity meant it could bring in more dollars. Um, and in really by by um, empowering different people, it could then allow them to go out and, you know, get new subscribers um, and say, look at what we're doing that's different from and really stand out in, in contrast to network uh, television. So, so it's interesting because um, there are these moments where you see possibilities because it's an upstart kind of scrappy industry and they're just looking for new ideas um, and willing to, and people could climb the ladder in ways that perhaps they couldn't at the network, like at a network um, television uh, company. Thank you. 
I have two questions I'm going to join together that come at the subject from very different perspectives. Michael Bender asks uh, or writes that he looks at American politics and what he sees is coalescence instead of fragmentation. The GOP moves to the right, shedding modern Republic moderate Republicans. The Democratic Party moves to the left, losing conservative blue dog Democrats in the process. While not cable TV, Rush Limbaugh's listeners love to refer themselves as ditto heads, which seems to be the epitome of coalescence. The opinion-driven cable news channels group their like-minded viewers together, and he sees this as coalescence, not fragmentation. Um, and coming at it from a different perspective, um, Megan Easley Walsh writes, with a plurality of media presence resulting in more segmented politics and even wildly different versions of the facts, do you see a way forward for a more united or at least more civil future? You know, it's interesting. I, I think, you know, um, to, to Michael Bender's point, like there is you know, figures like Newt Gingrich recognize early on that he can build a national audience and find people that have the, the same values that he wants to kind of bring to politics, that same disruptive. Um, so there, there are some kind of ideological um, issues that he's interested in, but he's also got a very particular style that he wants to bring in um, as well, and that he can appeal to people across the country and kind of build this build a community. It's a very small community, but it's very loyal. And he recognizes that this is something that he could never do in his home representative uh, community, you know, the, for the people he represents. He can't build that big of a national name for himself and that kind of uh, national following. So it's kind of like um, you, the narrowing and nationalization, if you will, of, of politics that, that, you know, someone like him recognizes the, the potential of that. And I will say that there is um, one of the things I looked at um, are a lot of the viewer letters that people wrote to C-SPAN, uh, especially during the 80s when people talked about like what C-SPAN meant to them. Uh, and, and it was really shocking how so many people were turning to cable looking for community. Uh, they were looking for people that maybe didn't think like them in their their small town, but maybe they they found someone in a call-in program that said something maybe smart, maybe off the wall, um, I maybe offensive, but connected with them. And so there is, I think, uh, this this turn towards community that's there. And that's something that politicians are trying to build for themselves. It's something that cable companies early on um, uh, exploit. HBO sold itself is that you can be part of this exclusive community if you subscribe to HBO. So I think that infusing this sense of a community um, is, is there from really, um, especially by the, the late 1970s as a, a business strategy first and then a political strategy. In terms of where we go, um, I have been asked this a lot um, in interviews of, well, what now? Now that we have this world, what are the, the solutions? And even though the, the book as you read from, and, and Nikki you read the last line, it's not the most optimistic line. <laughs> I have to say one of the things that I find, um, I am an optimist, I, I truly am. Uh, I And I, one of the things I find that's really interesting right now is that there's a lot of frustration and anger with our current political and media landscape um, and seeing the, 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 the problems with the two is interconnected. Um, and I think there's a recognition of this. Um, and again, it goes across the political spectrum. Um, and it does make me think about this moment in the late 1960s and early 1970s, where there's this same, um, there, there are a lot of divides, there's a lot of distrust, there's a lot of anger that people have about both their political system and their media system. And those undergo dramatic changes uh, moving forward. There are new technologies um, that come into play um, and then new policy choices um, that are made over how to structure them. Um, and so I think that we are at a moment to perhaps rethink um, some of the assumptions that have undergirded our both political and media system. And I don't have the solution, but I do know that bringing, uh, understanding how it operates and then bringing, having a productive conversation, not to just introduce things from the past, but to, to think creatively about potentials moving forward. Um, that, that's, a, that's a very real possibility. Thank you. 
in the book, you deal a good deal with the competition and the hostile relationship between the broadcast networks and the upstart uh, and then growing and influence cable industry. But Catherine Albanese asks if you to comment on the cooperation between cable and network broadcasting. Uh, that is shared commentary between NBC and MSNBC. So how has that relationship changed in more recent decades? Yeah, everything changes with the 1996 Telecommunications Act, <laughs> because then that allows ownership structures to change, where now, um, before then, uh, 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 network broadcasting could not own cable systems. Um, they could maybe, there could be a glitch where they could have a small one, but they couldn't own a, a major corporation. Um, uh, they could maybe, uh, they could own different networks. They could own programming, um, but they couldn't actually merge um, their entire corporations. And the 96 Telecommunication Act gets rid of that and allows major corporations across mediums or across medias to, to converge. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, it wasn't as much about competition. Um, and so you have the merger of telephone, internet, and cable, and broadcasting, come, all of a sudden they can come together and find um, similarities, um, uh, synergies, if you will. Isn't, isn't that a key term, uh, Margaret, from corporate lingo in the 1990s, uh, where they could look for these synergies? And and then all of a sudden it wasn't as, com as much of a competition because they could just focus on where their, their uh, profit interests and their economic interests aligned. Would you agree? Does that fit with your work too, Margaret? <laughs> yep. I think that Nikki and I are in strong agreement that the 1990s are a pivotal decade. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. I will jump Agreed. on that. <laughs> the term synergies was popular in the 1990s. Why is my university still using it? Uh, <laughs> time to jettison and come up with new lingo. Um, <laughs> So let me ask one last question, if I may, and this has to do with how you weigh the influence of this particular industry slash technology. And so there's been a lot written in recent years, let's see, by some people on this very screen, um, you know, about the ways in which um, political polarization um, was driven by a variety of techniques. Um, so the rise of direct mail, the recognition that you can really target narrowly certain segments of the population and fire them up and extract contributions from them, you know, or talk radio um, that uh, the right specialized uh, in um, uh, for the longest time. Uh, and then there's cable. Uh, and then, of course, there's the politicians themselves, you know, who are looking around for techniques to bolster their own standing and to increase donations. So given the broader landscape, um, how much weight would you place on the cable industry itself um, in either driving or facilitating this process compared to, say, you know, other techniques um, uh, and mechanisms for mobilizing kind of micro and larger constituencies. Well, I don't think you can really separate it um, from these other developments because they are all happening at the same time and they're learning from one another. And that's what's really interesting. You know, some people who are imagining about what to do with cable, with this narrow casting potential, different political consultants are saying, wow, Cable is basically like direct mail, but on TV. Um, it's very, you know, so they're aware of this. They're they're learning from one another. Um, you know, Fox News is looking. You know, Roger Ailes is seeing the success of Rush Limbaugh and saying, okay, let's bring this to Fox News because look at how profitable it is. Um, they're working together, and I think that's the other thing is that you know, um, someone like uh, Roger Ailes' work had a very close relationship uh, with Rush Limbaugh, um, and then you. You know they they advertise for one another um and you know nikki can talk in much more depth about this as well but there is this they all are recognizing shared values that they can 
bring to make more money and to have more political influence. Um, and so I think that cable is a very instrumental part of that, um, but it is very much, um, it's developing and learning from other mediums. Um, and I think that's one of the really fascinating things is to see those connections where people are saying that works really well here, let's try it here. Um, and, and that's one of the, um, you know, just seeing time and time again, how they're, they're look, looking for what is profitable. Um, and, uh, and, really, you know, outrage is profitable. Um, and that, that's something that becomes, a, a, and it's effective politically um, as well. And so again, profits and efficiency, um, these become those shared values and they're, they're all talking with one another and sharing strategies um, about how to make more money by doing this. Thank you. We could go on for quite some time, but I unfortunately have to draw this to a close. It's now 5.30. So I want to thank our participants, Catherine, Margaret, and Cole, for this conversation. Thanks to those of you in the audience for your questions. Please remember you can join us next week when we reconvene uh, on November 27th at 4 p.m. Eastern time for a session on Martin Seuss's new book, The Nationalist Dilemma, A Global History of Economic Nationalism, 1776 to the Present, with Erica Rappaport of UC Santa Barbara as our commentator. Till then, thank you. Take care. We hope your holiday weekend is a good one. Good night.